permit me to welcome to the podium our brother, Pastor God J. Osaretin, to give us his 30 minutes presentation. You are welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pastor God Osaretin Binoba. I am a member of National Youth Council, Directorate of Interfaith and Conflict Resolution. It's a great honor and a great privilege given to me to be one of the co cool debater this evening. As you remain, may the Lord bless you all. Our topic today we are deliberating is center is Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb of God that took away the sin of man. And the question is yes. As my Bible tells me, it is the only scripture that guards my faith, which I lay my confidence upon at the word of God that never change, that never fail. It is a word that I come to believe that everything written in the Holy Scripture is what that guard my faith, guard my action, guard my word, and guard my belief. And I, with this, I believe that Jesus Christ is the sacrificial lamb of God that take away the sins of man. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did he, the, the God man, have to subject himself to a crucifixion? Why must Jesus die? Why must he subject himself to that crucifixion? The cooler method of death in ancient world, to be crucified, to be more before the people, is where the Bible tells us that Jesus died ultimately for our, for our salvation. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our sin was upon him. That is the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. Remember the Holy Scripture said, sin cannot go unpunished. Overlooking sin will make God unjust. Therefore, it's just consequence for, for his is dead. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is dead. That Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Dead is not just physical dead, but a dead we are talking about, a dead that separates you from the presence of God, that separates you from eternal life, that is the life of paradise, the life of heaven. To the light that end the destruction, that is her. See, led man to her. But salvation led man toward to eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. But because of the, the great love for humanity and his God of willingness to forgive mankind their sin, for no man should go to her, her he gave his begotten son. That is the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. Say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but what? Shall have eternal life. But before Christ came, there was a way the people were doing a peace God if a man commits sin. Life on the days of the prophet, the day of prophet Mo Moses, like prophet Musa, in their day, there was ways and manner in which God have encouraged them that whosoever that commits sin, whosoever that does abominable thing that led to death and will lead to hell, there are ways to atone for their sin. Which God have recommended. Because sin separates man from the love of God. It is sin that brought man to the level we are today upon the earth. When God created Adam and Eve, there were no sin. Or the they fall into temptation. When they fall into temptation, sin come upon man. And the purpose God created man for a man to enjoy the good thing God has created to have a dominion, everything will withdraw from man. Man that was not supposed to struggle, he began to struggle. So that was where the beginning of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis chapter 3. But the only way for man 
sin to be forgiven, God now recommend a way out of that situation. The way a man of God recommend for that situation was for the people of God to sacrifice. Sacrifice now comes sin. If you read the book of the book of Leviticus, chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, you will discover that what time will not permit us to begin to for me to begin to open the Holy Scripture, but I can paraphrase and tell you what is in that area. But God recommends that every man that sin for his sin to be forgiven, to be atoned, they need to sacrifice what? A sheep or goat. That is what the people of God were doing in the days of old. They continue to do it before a prophet will enter the, a priest, they call it a high priest, who is the child of the altar of God, who mediate between the people and the God Almighty. So before the priest could be able to sacrifice to God in the mercy seat, in the sanctuary of God, that in the temple of the living God, there are procedures that you need to follow. One, he to kill an animal for himself. Because he cannot appear before the mercy seat of God. If he is to appear before the mercy seat of God or clean, he will die. So if any priest that is entering into this tabernacle of God, they call it the holies of holies. In the, in the Old Testament, in the old days, the way they build their temple, there is a courty that separates the outer court, the inner court, from the outside court. So before it could enter the inner court, which is the holy source holy, to go at all for the sins of mankind, of the Israel, or the people of God, to carry the blood to the mercy seat, he must first and foremost kill an animal for himself, to cleanse himself. Because if he appears before the mercy seat or clean, he will eventually die instantly. So if a priest is going into the inner, the, the holies of holies, they call it the holies of holies. If you are not pure, you cannot enter there. They will tie a chain on his waist. Chain, big chain. The chain, as he's going, the chain will load to outside. The people will hold the chain when he has to go in. They will put bear that will be ringing. If eventually he, he enter the place and the bell is no longer ringing, they will drag him out. That means he appear before God unclean and he will die. They will drag the priest out. That was the situation the people found themselves. Every year they begin to kill animal. What was the purpose of killing the animal? To atone for their sin. For their sin to be forgiven. For them to appear before God as a holy people of God. Every day they bring that animal, they begin to slaughter it. That was what they were doing. But one thing I know that every blood that you kill animal, it not only cleans sin, what it does, it covers sin. Because anything you cover will be uncovered. But the blood of this one doesn't cover sin. What does it do? It cleans sin. Anything that it cleans, it cleans forever. That is what the blood of Jesus does. So they were doing this in the era of the priest. The era of the Old Testament. But yet, they were still under the bondage of Satan. Satan will still be the accuser of brethren. Who will still prevailing over the activities of the life of man. Until God sent his son. Sent Jesus Christ. Yeshua Mashua to come and die for the sins of mankind. Because God saw that man could no longer help himself. The situation they have found themselves. They begin to kill animals every year in order to appease a God. Yet, even while they kill it, they still find themselves in it. That was the situation the people found themselves. Until Christ come to come and die for the sins of mankind. He said, The priest met of faith. She was in dominance. Jesus took up the mantle and became an advocate. In the court of heaven, pleading out case, our cases. Consequently, Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, became the only ultimate acceptable atonement for our sin. Neither by the blood of gold or calf, 
But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained the eternal redemption for, for his. For, for his. He became the only mediator between God and human, human. Not just that, not just that, for our sin, no human could die in the place of other. For all human have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ was a just man. Which no man here now can say Jesus Christ that is seed found in him. Even while the people of old that crucified Jesus Christ, he was accused, but they were unable to substantiate the claim that this was the offense of Christ. But they crucified him because it was written that his mission of coming to this earth as the savior of the world is to die for mankind. Jesus Christ was crucified. He was sacrificed. He was crucified in order to atone for the sins of mankind. In order to justify man. In order to redeem man from the bondage of sin. Sin separate man from God. Sin open door for devil to have a feast over the life of man. If you are not the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden, I am here to let you know the crisis and trouble that is upon the earth today will not find its way. Because the plan of God to us all is of good, not of evil. But when Satan came in, I said, what well, Satan, when Satan, when Satan were banning for the throne of heaven, he was wondering because there is no place for him. But all he could do is to deceive Eve and which eventually lead to the fall of Adam and lead to the fall of yet a born generation. Today's generation we find ourselves. But Christ came to redeem man. Christ came to, the, re, re, to restore man back to the purpose of what God has created of all. That is salvation. To come and bring hope to the hopeless world. To come and save man from the bondage of sin. To come and save man from the walls of darkness. The Christ was crucified. Why was Christ crucified? He could offer himself because he was the holy. He was pure. He was holy. Even in the days of priests, when they were sacrificing animals, you don't sacrifice animal that is that is not pure, animal that is sick, animal that is disabled, animal that have an error. But every animal that was sacrificed in the mercy seat of God, in the era of the priests, or the days of old were animals that were pure. They don't just sacrifice animals for animal sake. No, because of sake of sacrifice. No. That animal will be animal that is pure. It's one of the criteria. You can read, read your Bible in the book of Leviticus, chapter 6, verse 1 to the earth. You begin to see the requirement before you can offer that sacrifice. Now, this guy is the holiest of holies. Which no man here can dispute. He was the one that is qualified to be sacrificed for the sins of man. Because he's only and pure. And he was actually sacrificed for the sins of mankind. So that man will be redeemed. How did you have? I'm coming. He became the only mediator between God and human. In the mediator. That is why we that are in the Christian faith, whenever you face challenges, whenever you mention that name, because it's the Redeemer, Satan becomes helpless. Whenever you are praying on situation, you mention the blood of, this, of Jesus, that the blood of the Lamb of God, you see a reaction. Satan becomes helpless because the blood of Jesus Christ conquers Satan. There is power in that blood. That is the blood that brought salvation to mankind. It's not the blood of animal. The blood of animal could not able to bleed salvation to man. But the blood of Jesus brought man salvation. He said, for all have seen are conscious of the glory of God. When a man first seen, what happened? You are full of the glory of God. When you are living in sin, as a child of God, devil begin to have a dominion over your life. It begin to molest your life. But that's what the situation of the world are. 
but the blood of Jesus Christ justifies us. He said, how do you have faith in the atomic blood of Jesus Christ? How do you believe that the blood of Jesus Christ can actually cleanse your sin? Can actually redeem you? He says, it's sacrificial that take away your sin. You need to repent of your what? Of your sin. Here are the steps to true repentance. Follow them and your sin will be forgiven. When we talk of salvation, we are talking of forgiveness of sin. Hello, forgiveness of sin. When we talk of salvation, we are talking of the good things of God. They fulfilling the promises and the covenant of God upon his children. Now, one of the steps for you to benefit, to have faith that the blood of Jesus Christ has actually delivered you. One, recognize that you are a sinner. I have Godly sorrow for what you have done in disobeying God's commandment and causing pay to others. One, if you are a sinner, agree that you are a sinner, then you not pay work for forgiveness. But if you are a sinner, you never agree that you are a sinner, your sin cannot even be forgiven. Secondly, it says, convert your sin to God in prayer and ask Him to forgive your sin. Thirdly, he said, forsake those sins. Those sins you find yourself doing. Forsake that. He said, believe God has forgiven you and stop feeling guilty. When God has forgiven your sin, believe God has forgiven your sin. He said, he said, accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord and turn to God in righteous living. For your sin to be forgiven, you need to give your life to Jesus. He said, I am thy way. He said, I am thy truth. He said, I am the life. He said, no man comment unto his fatherly heaven. I said through him. He said, you shall know the truth. He said, that truth shall make you free. Know the truth. The price Jesus has paid for humanity. Know the truth. The sacrifice that Jesus has offered unto you. Offered unto me. And yet upon. By believing Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And your sin will be forgiven. He said, ratify your problem caused by your sin. If you offend a man, restitution is allowed in the Christian dawn. Confess your sin and it shall be forgiven. He said, the ultimate result of sacrifice of Jesus, the ultimate result. He said, what? In the book of John, chapter 19, verse 30, the sick of recorded that in the last word of Jesus on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he by his head, I gave all the ghost. The last word Jesus said in the cross, when he was laid to the cross, he said it is finished. That was the last word. And that word is symbolized great thing. The expression, it is finished, is a translation of the, of the Greek word that said, Telestia. Wish me to bring to an end to complete or to accomplish it connotes a successful end of a course of action. You know, when Jesus Christ was crucified, when Jesus Christ was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary, the last word he said, he said it is finished. After he was molested, he was despised. As he spoke that word, he said it is finished, he gave out the ghost. That word, it is finished, symbolized something. That the battle has come to an end. It symbolizes that victory has been given to humanity. It symbolizes that God has restored my back to the purple God that created man before the devil snatched that dominion from Adam and Eve. So it is finished. It is. It's a not a successful cause of a nation. On the cross, one may say that Jesus was signal comp comprehensive and comforted the creation of what it is finished. That word is finished, it is very important. We that are in the Christian dome. That is why, no matter the challenges we are passing through, we believe that Jesus Christ has done the work, it is finished. And when you begin to confess it is finished, that situation it is finished. It is finished, your sin is finished, forgiven. What the blood of Ram could not do, the blood of God could not do, the blood of the Son of God had done it. 
the expression actually signifies that he has fulfilled the whole of the Father's will concerning the redemption and his mission on earth accomplished. Every man has a mission. Every prophet of God you see in the scripture, they have a mission they came to fulfill. You have a mission that God has assigned you to come and fulfill here. You, we are not born here without purpose. But not every man that God created here that fulfilled purpose. But the purpose of Christ here on earth was not to marry, was not to build mansion, was not to acquire certificate or title. But his mission is to what? To come and save mankind. The meaning of Jesus is Savior. To come and save mankind from sin. To come and save mankind from the power of darkness, the power of Satan. That was his mission. So when Christ accomplished that, that greater, it's a greater for him to face that humiliation. It's a greater for him to be crucified. It's a greater that he fled a battle him. It's a greater that he was more before the people. He said it is finished. He said it is finished. That word could need that whatsoever be your situation, it is finished if you believe. He said, all prophecies of the Old Testament we pointed to the suffering of Messiah have now been fulfilled. Before Christ was born, there will be prophecy. In the days of old, prophet of old, they prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. If you read the book of Isaiah chapter 53 from verse 1 to the end, you will discover that everything Christ does was already written. He came to fulfill what I've been written about him. He has come to die for the sins of mankind so that man will be justified. He said, His death and resurrection accomplished this follow thing. There are things I want you to know. I want you to know what the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the sacrificial lamb of God came to fulfill. One, he brought salvation. To the death and the resurrection of Christ brought salvation to mankind. Anyone repent of their sin, confess, forsake them, believe in Jesus, is saved. Hell is no longer your portion if you can believe in Christ. Sanctification, it came to sanctify man. The power to live above sin is not an easy thing. You cannot do it with, with a carnal flesh. You need the spirit of God to be able to live above sin. So Jesus Christ came, he dead and in resurrection, Okay, to satisfy man, to able to live above sin. Thirdly, Holy Spirit baptism. The death and the resurrection of Christ, as he ascended to heaven, the Spirit of God, the Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, the, the apostles were baptized, the disciples, with power. The Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you can do all things. You can walk in the way of the Lord. It is the, the Spirit of God that directs man how to walk in the way of the Lord. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, you begin to walk in the path of the just, not the path of the evil, not the path of the wicked. It brings for the bring healing and deliverance. That is why today, as I'm a pastor, if any man is sick among us here, anywhere, I pray for him by faith in Christ. Say, by the name of Jesus Christ, this sickness, this challenge is over and everything comes to an end. Without using any mercy. But only by the mention of that name of Jesus Christ, that thing comes to an end. It brings healing and deliverance. It brings dominion and power. Today, I fear no Satan. When I mention the name of Jesus Christ, witches and wizards bow. The kingdom of darkness bow. The marine kingdom bow. Occulting power bow. Why? By the blood of Jesus here. That is the blood that defeats Satan. That is the blood that defeats the works of darkness. But if you can believe, he said, accept to God, accept to God through. You know, before now, people cannot approach the holies of holy. There was a curtain that demarcated them, be the holies of holy. So let the IP that goes in there. But when Jesus Christ died, immediately Jesus stopped the last breath of life. What happened? There was a thunder that struck. It tear the curtain that separate the people from the holy soul. They cannot approach God except through their priest. But today you can, I can approach God through the name of Jesus Christ. Note, we are enjoying this benefit of victory 
or the cross of Jesus, only when we have taken the step of true repentance, discuss above. May God grant you those victory in Jesus' name. Amen. My beloved brethren, I am only here to let you know the truth that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ truly is to come and die for the sins of mankind. That was just the mission. Because man could not able to save himself with the blood of ram, the blood of goat, except the blood of Jesus Christ. That was the blood that set me free. That is the blood that set you free. But if you can believe. I end my top message, my debate, by telling you that Jesus died. On the third day, he resurrected. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the presentation of Pastor God Day. I now have the honor to invite to the podium Sheikh Ahmad Muhammad Awad to give his speech on the topic, Is Jesus Christ a sacrificial lamb of God that took away the sins of mankind? You are welcome, Sheikh. قل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوكا نزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزد الظالمين إلا خسارة. Truth have come and falsehood have perished. Any time truth comes, falsehood is bound by nature to perish. بل نكسب بالحق على الباطل فيت مغوه. Nay, when we fling the truth against falsehood, it shatters his brain and destroys it. Woe unto those who ascribe partners to Allah which he did not assign. Wakala tahaza rahmanu walada. لك جئتم شيء إذا تكاد السماوات يتفترن منه وتشق الأرض وتخير الجبال حدا عند أول الرحمن ولدا وما ينبغي للرحمن أن يتهز ولدا إن كل من في السماوات والأرض إلا آت الرحمن عبدا. and they say the merciful God have begot a son. this is one of the most horrible abomination they can ever attribute to God Almighty. If the heavens have feelings like you and I, it will have fall down in total ruins for making that pronouncement. And if the mountains have feelings also like you and I, it will have crumbled to dust for saying that God be God's son. And if the earth have feelings like you and I, it will scatter in ruin for saying that God Almighty have be God's son. And the Aul Rahman Walada. It is not fitting, it is not consistent with the majesty of God Almighty to begot a son. Whatsoever is in the heaven and earth must come to God Almighty or Allah as a servant of Allah. Mr. Chairman, respected guests, Godi, and all the sisters and brothers who have uh, graced this occasion. I greet you with the Universal Gifts of Islam, and that is Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. Actually, this mode of greetings is not just for Muslims. It should be Pastor Gaudi and his community also have to say that. Why did I say that? Because Jesus said that. He spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. Aramaic is a colloquial of the Hebrew language. It's very close. And the Arabic language is also Semitic language. So you have Arabic, Phoenician, Assyrian, Armenian, Aramaic, and Hebrew. These are the Semitic language of which Muhammad is part and parcel of. And so when the Hebrew says shalom, in Arabic it means salam, meaning peace. If the Hebrew said navim, in Arabic it's nabi, meaning a prophet. The Hebrew said Gehenna, in Arabic is Jahannam, meaning hellfire. The Hebrew said Bushar, in Arabic is Bashar, meaning flesh. 
The Hebrew said Qutub in Arabic, Kitab, meaning books. The Hebrew said Rushul in Arabic, is Rasul, meaning a prophet. And the Hebrew said El, Elah, Eli, Eloi, Alaha, Elohim. And in Arab, we say Allah. Allah. Do you see the coloration? Do you see how they move side by side? This is just an introduction. The pastor really did not fit in the category that I've placed him. Because what he did was, he was preaching in a pulpit. But I'm looking for academic exercise. I'm looking for research, not just a dogma to believe in. Yes, I was born a Muslim. My father and my mother were Muslims. But when I grew up, my research made me a believer, not just a Muslim. So this is how it should be. He just preached to us. He believed that. But I did not see any empirical evidence established that Christ was the sacrificial son or the being that died to neutralize the mysterious curse of our blood system. I did not see any research being mentioned about that. All this thing is hinged. Jesus have to die to save the sin of mankind. He must die because if he did not die, his blood is not going to clean us. So the total of Christendom is actually hinged on the fact that he was crucified. Why should he die? Because he is perfect, never commit any sin. There is not a single stain in the life of Jesus, according to the Christians. I did not say that. But before I venture into my talks, I would refresh the memory of the pastor and all the Christians who are here with all due respect. That Jesus said in the Matthew, book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus said, anyone who curses his brethren or who tells him you are a fool, that person has incurred the wrath of God, he's going to go to hell. Don't say to your brother he's a fool. In other words, don't curse. That's a very good advice by Jesus Christ, my master himself. But in the same verse, Matthew chapter 23, verse 19, Jesus said to his people, you fools, you hypocrites. What was he doing? He should go to hell. According to the standard of the Bible, I did not say that the Bible said that. Don't misconstrue me by saying, I am saying for Christ to go to hell. No, in Islam, he is one of the closest human, human prophet, all of them, the best prominent five. So we cherish Jesus so much, but I'm only talking about the record that you have in front of you. And then we have again in the book of Matthew chapter 23 verse 19, Jesus said to his elders, you swines, you snakes, you whited sepulchre, you vipers, how long will you escape the damnation of God? He was cursing them. Meanwhile, he says, anyone who curses will go to hell. I don't know if he's going to go to hell because this is what he does. Saying one thing and making another thing. So if you curse someone, you have sinned. Did Jesus sin by cursing people? I don't understand baptism. Jesus was baptized by, the river, uh, by John the Baptist at the River Jordan. What was the need for baptism? Look at the dictionary. Baptiz baptism is done for the remission of sin. Baptism, I repeat, is done purposely for the remission of sin. Why did Jesus get baptized? I want to ask the question. Maybe the pastor will explain. Why did Jesus baptize? Is he sinful or sinless? Jesus telling his disciples how to pray to God Almighty. You know, in the book of Matthew. Oh, our Father. Everybody knows that. At the end, he said, you know, hello, forgive us our sin. Forgive us. He didn't say forgive you. Forgive us our sin. As we sin against who sinned against us. Is he sinful or sinless? Jesus Christ in the book of Luke chapter 19 verse 27. He said, in Israel, in Jerusalem, Jesus said, any one of you who do not want me to be his king, bring them here and cut their throat before me. It's in the book. I'm not minting words. Check the book. I'm quoting at Beveric. I don't add, I don't delete. So you check as I read, you check your books. So why would he kill somebody if the person doesn't want to believe him as a king? 
We read in the book of Matthew again, chapter 10, verse 34. Jesus said, Do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. No, I have not come to bring peace. I've come to bring sword. It's in the book. I've come to divide mother and father, a man and his neighbor. Oh, how happy would I be if all these things are in place. Is this a sinful person or a sinless person? In the book of Matthew, I'm sorry, John chapter 2 verse 3, Jesus spoke to his mother in this fashion. There was a marriage at Canaan. It's a feast. So they invited Jesus Christ with his companion. When they came, they began to imbibe wine. So eventually, the wine got finished. So when the wine got finished, Mary, listen to this, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she came to him because she knew he had mysterious powers. She said to him, look, we don't have no wine. Yeah, you could check it out. We don't have no wine. And uh, people are coming in. What do we do? She expects him to do some miracle. You know what he said? He said, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. Is that how you speak to your mother? I wouldn't do that to my mother. I don't expect you to speak to your mother in that fashion. But Jesus Christ, the Quran exonerates him. He's not miserable or outspoken. He is kind to his mother. He's not insultive. What kind of prophet is that? Telling your mother, woman, what have I to do with thee? This woman carries you for nine months. And because of you, she, you know, the insults, the insinuations she had, they call her names. In the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they have a commentary books. I don't know if the pastor knows that book, Mishnah, Talmud, and Haggadah. These are the commentary books of the Jewish people. In that book, they call Mary a hairdresser. Because in Judaism culture, hairdressing is horrible. It's a horrible trade. And they say in, in, in Talmud, they said that, that Mary went and had a relationship with a Roman soldier by the name of Pandera, and they had Jesus. That's what the Quran said. This is the Azim calling her names and Jesus also. I did this, I'm going to start right now. Let me just cut this down. I didn't start. I'm going to start right now. So, the connection of Jesus to die, we're looking for someone that is pure to die, who have never committed any sin. Jesus, according to the Bible, have committed, that's that I know, 85 different sins. This is as a result of research. I'm just quote, I quoted few. He even called a human being a dog, an Arab woman, an Arab woman. Jesus called her a dog. This can be recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verse, verse 21. She saw Jesus Christ walking on the way. She ran to him. She said, Master, my daughter is possessed with the devil. Please heal her. You know what Jesus did? He turned around like this. And she came to the side, crying profusely, Master, oh thou son of David, my daughter is possessed with the demon. Please heal her. He turned around like this. The third time, she came and stood in front of him, and the Bible says she scooped down, and she said, Oh Lord, help me. My daughter is sick. She possessed demon. Jesus began to walk. He never spoke a word because she's an Arab. She was crying. Then Peter said, Master, heal her, for she is crying unto us. In other words, do her something. You know what Jesus said? It is not good to take the children's bread and give it to a dog like her. Subhanallah. I don't say Muhammad, I will say that. Wallahi, it is in the book. If it is not, I want the pastor to say I'm lying. Prove me wrong. He said, it is not good to take the children's bread and give it to a dog like her. And her face changed. Then she said, Master, even the dogs will eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. You're not going to give me the bread? What is the bread? The Injil, the Evangel, the good news, it was meant for Israelites. She, an Arab. So in this connection, I have seen three things in this quotation. Lack of mercy on the part of Jesus. If it is true, but the Muslim believe it's not true. It's merciless. This is your record. Number two, I have seen 
racism on the part of Jesus. He's a Jew, she's an Arab. I'm not going to heal him. It's meant for the Israelite. And number three, I've seen a strong woman because at the end, she licked the ground and ate the crumbs and she was healed. And Jesus looked at her and said, Woman, let it be done as thou will. You want to eat the crumb? Fine. Let it be done as thou will. But my will is not to give you the bread. Eat the crumbs. And she was healed. So is this sinful or sinless? Is Jesus qualified indeed as a prophet or messenger or a son of God indeed preeminent to be the sacrificial lamb to cleanse the sin of us sinless? No. Because the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 said all God Almighty speaking he said all souls are mine all the soul belongs to me, Allah said that. Then God says something which you have to listen. He said, the soul that sin, it shall die. The father will not bear the iniquity of the son, nor the son bear the iniquity of the father. The wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon him who sin, and the righteousness will also be upon him who is righteous. But if the wicked turn around and do that which is good, I, God Almighty, I will blot his sin and I will never remember it. This is Islam. That each and every, if me and the pastor are twins, identical twins, then I went and committed a crime. We looked so close, identical twins. And the FBI came along. They're looking for me and they saw him and they grabbed him, thinking that that's him, but that's me. He said, look, I'm his brother, but take me instead. They just laugh at you. You crazy? He committed it. He got... If you do the crime, you do the time. This is the justice of human being. Why would God Almighty kill an innocent person who never commit any crime to neutralize the mysterious curse of mankind? What kind of justice is this? Why didn't God go himself and die? Why would he throw this is child abuse? This is child abuse. Why would you send an innocent baby, your son, to die? You throw him under the bus. Why wouldn't you go yourself and die? This, this is celestial injustice if it is true. Because when we go back to Abraham, Cain, Cain and Abel, they were the sons of Adam alayhi salam. Cain was the wicked one. Abel was the good one. When they die, eventually, Cain went to hell and Abel went to heaven who died for Cain who died for Cain at that time it is whatever you do that's re you reap what you sow you can't plant tomatoes and expect a peanut to come out impossible how about those who died before Jesus came he was trying to embellish it and giving it okay back then people the lamb this is the pagan ritual I don't know if you if you know Adonai, Adonai Ekel, which is a Greek pantheon god, long before Christ was born, died to neutralize the sin of his people. Bacchus, Elohe, died. It's a pagan god. I'm calling you the pagan god of the Greeks, the mythology of Greeks. These gods die to save their people. Apollo died to save the sin of his people. In fact, Mithra, the sun god, he mutilated himself to death so that his blood will be used to clean the pure people. This is a pagan ritual which crept into the mainstream Christianity because Jesus warned the people, don't take my religion to the pagans. I came for Israelite. Where do you find that? In the book of Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Jesus spoke to the disciples and said, these 12 Jesus commissioning them by saying, Go ye not, don't go into any way of the Gentiles, but go ye nor any way of the Samaritans, but go ye rather unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, for I am not sent, but unto the lost tribal house of Israel. That is why Jesus selected 12 disciples. Each one of them will represent the 12th nation, the children of Jacob. They will represent them. Jesus never spoke outside Jerusalem. Never. He never convert anyone in Jerusalem. An Arab woman came and he kicked her out. He came. What he came to do, he did. And whatever he did, it shows that he came for the Israelites. So Jesus did not actually die. 
The Quran is clear. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ وَإِنَّ الَّذِي نَخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِنْهُ مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ إِلْمٍ إِلَّا اتِّبَاءَ الزَّنْ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ They did not kill him and they did not crucify him. But it was made to appear to them so. But those who differ and write about these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God said they have no certain knowledge. إِلَّا اتِّبَاءَ الزَّنْ They follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. That's what happened. It's a fiction. Christ loved life. Let me give you a scenario. Let me give you a scenario. 24 hours before Jesus Christ was supposed to have been killed on the cross. And being on the cross is an ancient form of killing thieves, murderers, rapists, criminals. To die on the cross, it is abomination. It was the Greek and the Romans and the Phoenicians, the ancient idol worshippers. This is their form of killing rapists. Why would God allow his prophets or a messenger to die in a shameless, gruesome death like that? In fact, he did not die. According to the Bible, he did not die. This can be found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verse 23, 24, 25, and 26. That's where it stops. Deuteronomy. It says, if any man, listen to what he said, and tell me if Christ died. If any man commits a crime, and you hang him on a tree, and you hang him on a tree, you shall by no means bury him that same day. Because whosoever is hung on a tree is a curse from God. God said that. I didn't say that. So you either have to believe Jesus died, then he's a curse. I'm, I'm not going to believe in him. If he died, he's a curse according to your books. And Jesus would not die because the moment he died, he became a curse. That is why he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. I got to take off my shoe. I'm serious this time. <laughs> Don't I look good? And so we read the last testament of Jesus Christ according to Bart Ehrman, according to Josephus, according to Tacitus. These are ancient writers at the time of Jesus. These are the comments he made before he left the earth. He took his disciples when he knew that they were trying to kill him. So attempted murder, yes, they attempt to kill Jesus. I believe that from my research. They attempted to kill him. But murder, no. They attempt to kill him. So when he realized that they attempt to kill him, he took his disciple to where? To the Garden of Gethsemane. Garden of Gethsemane is the eastern part of the Temple of Solomon, which is very close to the river. So it's a strategic position that Jesus is there with the disciple. If anyone is coming, he will see them coming. So when he took his disciple, he said, Peter, you stay there. John, you stay here. You stay here. And he put them around. And he went a little further. The Bible said that this is Matthew 26, 39. And Jesus went a little further. And he fell on his face. And he prayed. And he said, oh, my father, let this cup pass away from me. Not as I will, but as thou will. Which cup? Which cup was he talking about? Death. To know that if there is a book, there's a Bible called the Bible with, with concordance and index. Each and every word used, they give you the meaning. So the word cup means death. He said, oh my father, let this death pass away from me, not as I will, but as thou will. He repeated the same thing in the book of Mark, chapter 14, verse 35. He said, Abba, Abba, I know that all things are possible with thee. Please remove this cup away from me. I don't want to test it. In the book of Luke 22, 39, being in an agony, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his face was blood as if on the ground to the sweat. And the angels came and strengthened him and assured him. Assured him. He was praying not to die. Why was he praying for? Take this cup away from me. Not as I will, but as thou will. So Jesus said, not as I will. He don't want to die. So why would God kill him? If God kill him, God have killed innocent person. Because Jesus said, he don't want to taste this day. But, you know, it's, it's up to you. Me, I don't want to taste it. Not my will, but as thou will. Didn't Jesus said in the book of Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it shall be given. Knock 
and it shall be open seek and you shall find what kind of father is that when you ask him for a bread he give you a stone or you ask him for a fish he give you a snake what kind of father is that ask you my father whatever you ask him he will give you so if you and i will ask god almighty to give us whatever we ask of him why wouldn't you think that jesus he would be more obedient closer to god he said i don't want to die look i didn't record this it's in the book so we have another connection in the book of Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 7. I want you all to listen to the mystery of this book and tell me if Christ died or not. Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 7. It reads, Who in the days of his flesh, at the time that Jesus Christ was walking in his flesh, he offered up prayers with crying and tears for the only one God who will save him from death. And God heard him. I'm going to repeat it again. Who in the days of his flesh, talking about Jesus, he offered up prayers and crying and tears and supplication to the only one God that can save him from death, and he was heard. Heard from what? The prayer that he was doing, which I quoted in Matthew, Luke, and John, that he doesn't want to die. So how did he die? What happened? You have to go back to the books written by Paul. Paul has never seen Jesus Christ. Never. Though they are contemporaries, but they've never met. They have, they have never met. So Paul wrote, the New Testament contained 27 books. Paul wrote 14 books, meaning Paul wrote half of, more than half of the New Testament. Now in these books, Paul write about die, his mysterious death, is the son, the this and that, and that. So Jesus have nothing to do with that because he told his disciple in the book of John chapter 14 verse 15, if you love me, my disciple, keep my commandment, not someone else's commandment. If you indeed love me, because you are the ones that will take you know, my, my, my message outside. If you love me, my disciple, keep my commandment. So is the law of Paul a commandment? When in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 12, Paul said, concerning, he said, I did not receive any commandment from the Lord, but I'm giving my opinion. In the book of God, check it out, it is in there. He said, I did not receive any commandment from the Lord. I'm speaking on my own. Then, in the same 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 25, Paul also said, concerning the women, I did not receive any commandment of the Lord. But me, according to my, you know, I'm just giving an opinion. So whatever he wrote, that was him. Why did I know that? Because Jesus was a Jew to the core. He followed the law of Moses. He never canceled it. This can be found in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to destroy the law of Moses and the other prophet that came before me. No. I did not come to cancel this law. I've come to fulfill. And I'm telling you, heaven and earth will pass, but a dot from the law of Moses shall not pass till all is fulfilled. And whosoever cancel a single law from the book of Moses will become least. But whosoever do the law of Moses and teach someone to do it will become great. He was not canceling the law. The law was canceled after he left in 325 AD in the Council of Nicaea, headed by King or Emperor Constantine, who was a pagan. Three, don't forget, 325 AD, that's when they sat down and they created the Eucharist, the atonement, the eating the body of Jesus, drinking his blood. Man, please. What are you doing to this humble human being? Eating his flesh? That's the communion that they do today. So Christ did not die on the cross. If he died on the cross, he's a curse. The Bible says that whosoever is hung on the cross is a curse of God. But you see, what Paul did was that he struggled to reconcile this quotation with what is in the book of Deuteronomy because Jesus knew all the law. Jesus knew all the law. So Paul said in the book of, in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 2, Paul said, but I, Paul said unto you, 
whosoever is circumcised have fallen down from grace. Christ will not benefit him. Don't circumcise. Canceling the law. Paul canceled all the law and wrote books. Galatians, Ephesians, Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, John. All these books written by Paul. Paul. They never, you contradict any Christian. Paul, Paul. How about Jesus? Why don't you quote Jesus? If you quote Jesus, it's very close to Islam. Get the Red Letter Bible and look at the Red Letter Bible, whatever Jesus said, and compare with the Quran. Wallahi, 99% very accurately the same. So Paul said about, you know, circumcision. I've got one minute. Let me rush. So Paul said, don't circumcise. If you circumcise, you would go to hell. Christ will not benefit you. But Jesus was circumcised. Following the law of Moses in the book of Genesis, God said to Abraham, Abraham, you and the men in your house and Ishmael, circumcised, and that would be a covenant between me and you. I will see to it that anyone who is circumcised have followed your way. That's why Muhammad is circumcised, we are all circumcised. Jesus circumcised in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 21. It reads, when he was eight days old, who? Jesus. He was circumcised and named by the angels Jesus. He was not but Paul said, don't circumcise. So you take your choice, the word of Jesus or the word of Paul. The word of Paul tells me that Jesus Christ was hung on the cross. He died to save mankind. That is a pagan mentality. Hebrews are one God worshippers. They don't do that. I'm going to reset my bullet, and I'll come back again in my rebuttal. Why do that one hundred percent? What I want you to know about the gospel of Christ, it's not about the gospel of human knowledge. It's a gospel of divine revelation. That is why when you read the Holy Scripture, and you want to begin to do interpretation, the way you read things fall apart, you go astray. Jesus said, the word that speak unto you, they are life and they are spirit. He said, they are life and they are spirit. What he one of the other I talk about, I say, why did Jesus Christ baptize? <clears throat> Jesus Christ make it know that it did not come to abolish the laws of the prophet. That was really true. But to strengthen them, to lay a good foundation. That is why today, even in the Christendom, because Jesus Christ baptized, we baptize. When it came to paradise, if you are sincere, you read your Bible. And if you believe in that Bible that you are actually studying, when it comes to the time Jesus wants to baptize, it comes before the John the Baptist. John the Baptist refused to baptize him. But Jesus told him something. That for to fulfill, or rather to fulfill the scripture. So he need to pass through this. It's not because Jesus Christ was not holy. I still stand categorically clear to declare my opinion, no, that Jesus is sinless in every aspect you may think of. Most of those words the Sheikh pointed out, it was not a word, a cause. It was a word of warning. If you do this, you will die and go to hell. If you do this, you will receive condemnation. It's not the call, it's a word of warning. And if you disobey it, you will see the consequence of that word. It's not a sin. It's not that Jesus has commit sin. Those are no sins. Those are no sin that Jesus can commit. Even Satan is aware in the kingdom of Satan that Jesus is just and righteous. He mentioned some areas about the birth of Christ Jesus. There are some books I don't read. Even when I read it, I don't believe. Because the testimony that Jesus Christ will concede to the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no book I will read that will change that thought for me. Mary have an encounter with an angel. He said, that thing that are impossible before men shall be possible. But if you can believe, you will see the performance of, of it. And she believed. Because we are serving God of possibility. Whom all things are possible. Mary conceived. 
It does not have any intercourse with any Roman soldier or Roman officials. Jesus Christ was conceived to the power of the Holy Spirit. There is nothing to dispute about that area. If you look at the Bible, in Bible, when you look at the book of John, the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, John, Luke, we call that the gospel. That is the gospel of Christ. In the gospel of Christ. You see the act of apostle. You see the word, the epistle of Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul really was not actually with Jesus Christ, but it does not mean that he did not know what happened. When the Spirit of God come upon a man, a man can give history how things come about. Can I say, Prophet Muhammad or the Islam, when you look at Quran, what happened that is in Quran, Prophet Muhammad was not yet born at that time. Let us be sincere. Based on the spirit of God that endured him, he was able to give a brief historical perspective of how this will come to be. Why? Was he actually alive when those events take place? Was he alive? He was not alive. But the spirit of God reminded him, bring everything to reality to him. But whatever you see about Apostle Paul, whatever you see what Apostle Paul arrived, is a thing that the Spirit of God brought, bring to remembrance. It's a revelation, it's a divine revelation knowledge of God. If you read the Bible, you discover that Prophet Moses is one of the great prophets in the Holy Scripture. He was not born when Abraham was alive. He was not born when Noah lived. He was not born when Adam and Eve lived. He was not born when uh, Abel lived. But those key Bible, Genesis, Exodus, you think of, were the workbooks written by who? Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Moses. But Moses was not yet born. Why? I didn't get to know it. By the divine knowledge, revelation of God. The gospel of Christ is about divine revelation. It's no human knowledge. It's not human knowledge. If you rely on human knowledge, you go astray. That is why some people owe Bible. They want to read Bible based the way they read other books. You will not, it will not benefit you. It will not enrich you because that word there is a spirit. It's a spirit. That's what Jesus says. He said, the word that speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. So there is nothing to dispute about that. There is no argument about that Jesus Christ did not die. Because I have not seen any Jews across the earth today that would dispute that their forefather never crucified Christ. They agree. That's why they never believe. Many of them never believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Many Jews never believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They are the they are Judaism. But they believe that their father, their forefather killed Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus died actually resurrected. And the grave is still there, it's an evidence. And no Jews have actually disputed it. When Jesus Christ went to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane, it was a battle of the spirit. You can't prevail over this uh, in physical, in flesh, without the spirit. Adam and Eve fell from the Garden of Eden to Satan. When he comes for the cry to, uh, to prevail, to deliver man from this supreme mission God has assigned him to redeem mankind for the power of Satan. Jesus went to the same garden. They called Garden of Gethsemane. It was the battle that Jesus fought. He was not there to relax. As the Sheikh said it, that when Jesus Christ prayed, the, the sweat that was coming that was thick like blood. It was the battle of the spirit for him to overcome the mission. The Bible may come to me and say, by strength shall no man prevail. When Jesus Christ was about to pay the price, truly, he made those comments that truly, the Father should take the cup away from him. But he says, not my will, but your will. That is why Jesus said, me and my Father, we are one. I can do nothing of my own except what the Father commanded him. 
So Jesus Christ, because he was a, a son of God who believed in the will of the Lord or the, or the Father, he never had his own will. He said, not my will, but your will. The will of God is for Christ to die for the sins of mankind. Which Christ paid the supreme price. Truly, though that in those days that actually the hang on the cross was a condemned criminals. That is why you read your Bible. You will discover that Jesus Christ was crucified are not, are not criminals. I'm robbers here. I'm robbers here. Truly, the Bible says, call this upon those that is hung on the tree. Because this will carry the course of the world upon his head. So we'll hang on the tree. Jesus will hang on the tree in the midst of the criminals. And the Bible bear that witness. He passed through that humiliation for man to be redeemed. But when you talk of the sacrifice the, 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 the Israel were doing, I don't believe the sacrifice Moses and Aaron were doing is a sacrifice of the, of the pagan. No. That is the instruction God gave to him. If you believe me, prophet, Musa, you will believe in all his, his teaching and his principles during his time. They were sacrificing animals, not to idol, but to their God. There is nothing to dispute about that. There is nothing to dispute about that. My beloved, it's a privilege given to me to actually present my view. My view is not to antagonize any man or any, any faith, but it to share more light what the gospel of Jesus Christ, what the mission of Christ come to fulfill upon the earth here. That is why when I was called upon, some of my colleagues wanted to say, uh, why do you want to go there? Because if you go there, they may not believe. I say, no, let me share I, why Christ come. And if there is enough time, for example, I swear, whatever, I, I see the differences. What the share were actually pointed, those they call the errors in the Bible, whatever, is not an error. But if there is a time, those areas, there are areas, there are no time that I can quote scripture, bring scripture to tell you, this area you are seeing, look at the Genesis. But there is no time. It's a great honor. I am glad to be here this night. I pray that the Lord bless you all. I'm going to run. I don't have too much time. I'm going to just I take the most important thing that he said, see if I could explain. Number one, he mentioned John 10, 30 to establish that Jesus Christ is some kind of a divine. Even though this, talk, this is a different topic. I don't, uh, we treat different topics, but this, I don't want to deviate, but I'm just trying to answer what he said. He said, John chapter 10, verse 30, uh, I and my father are one, trying to show that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Now, in comparative religious studies, this quotation, John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my father are one, full stop. We call that a fraud quotation. Where are the before and the after texts? You can't go cherry picking in the Bible. Why did Jesus say, I and my father are one? If I said, I and God are one, naturally you have questions in your mind. He's not Fulani Hausa, I am not this. So I said, Mr. Muhammad Awal, explain to me, what do you mean you are one? Oh, well, he doesn't drink, he doesn't gamble, he doesn't court, he doesn't date, he's a good person. I'm the same thing. Oh, in that sense, you are one. That's what Jesus meant. This is John chapter 10, verse 30, as he quoted. But I'm going to read from my head, John chapter 10, verse 23, all the way down to verse 30, and tell me if that's what he meant. It begins by saying, And Jesus walked in the Solomon's temple, and the Jewish came and surrounded him, brandishing their finger unto him. And they said to him, If thou art the Christ, tell us plainly, thou being a man, make it as a God. And Jesus said, I have told you, and you don't believe in me. If you don't believe in me, believe in the works that I do. My sheep, they hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And the Father who gave them, my disciple, to me, is greater than all of you. And no one among you, the Jewish, can take them out of my hand. Neither can you take them out of God's hand, because I and my Father are one. The context shows that in purpose they are one. Wallahi, God Almighty and Muhammad and Jesus are one in purpose, not in power, glory, divinity, omniscient. Me, 
the job that I've been doing for the past 25 years, I travel all over the world to share this world. Me and God Almighty are one. Why did I say that? Because God wants to reform all of us to become good people. And I'm doing the same thing. I want to reform everybody in purpose. Me and God are one. That's what Jesus meant by I and my Father are one, not in divinity. Okay. Um, to establish... To establish the fact that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross to save mankind. He's a human being. Look at what the Bible said in the book of Jonah, chapter 25, verse 4. It reads by saying, and tell me if Jesus Christ is indeed God or Son of God or something. It says, How can man, any man, compare himself with God? Listen carefully. How can any man compare himself with God? How can he be clean? Whosoever is born of a woman can never be clean, says the Bible. How was Jesus born? Of a woman. The Bible said, whosoever is born of a woman can never be clean. Even the moon and the star are nothing before God. How much more is man who is a womb and the son of man who is a maggot? Who is son of, uh, son of man? Ask any Christian, who is son of man? Jesus. So the Bible said, even the son of man is a maggot in front of God. So how could he equate God Almighty? Okay, he mentioned about Jesus, his divinity, when he said, he quoted uh, John 14, verse 6 to 8, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one go to the Father but through me. You heard that before? He just quoted that to prove that Jesus Christ is God, because he is the one. You can't go to heaven unless through him. So I was giving a talk in Hawaii. You know, Hawaii is in you know, United States, Hawaii. I was giving a talk in the University of Honolulu. I can't forget this, some, about two years ago. And someone said to me, Mr. Muhammad Awal, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the way? I said, Wallahi, I believe he's the way. Do you believe Jesus is the truth? I said, of course, I believe he's the truth. Do you also believe he is the way and that no one go to the Father but through him? I say, by God, I believe that also. And now he's scared now because I say I believe that. He said, this is the first time I've heard a clergy, a Muslim clergy, believe in this kind of stuff. I said, I believe in return. I have a question. <laughs> and the question is, you tell me, at the time of Noah, who was the way, the truth, and the life? There was no Jesus. At the time of Abraham and Moses, who was the way, the truth, and the life? Because he was the way. His way leads to God Almighty, no doubt. He was the truth because whatever he says, Abraham and Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Nehum, Habakkuk, all of them, their words was given to them by God. So they were the truth. And no one can go to heaven or paradise except he followed the prophet in town at that time. Jesus did not say, I am the only way. Have you noticed that? He said, I am the way. Yes, at the time that he existed, he was the way. But before he left, in the book of Mark, John chapter 14, verse 15, he said, Beloved, if you love me, keep my commandment, and I will pray, and the Father will send you another comforter. Look at the English. The Father will send you another comforter. That means there was a comforter before. If I say I will give you another Quran, that means I gave you a Quran before. So the Father will send you another comforter. The question is, who was the first comforter? Jesus. He was the first comforter. Jesus said, if I go, another comforter will come, flesh and bones, talking to you just like I'm doing. And that is Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's proving in the book of John 16, verse 12. John 16, verse 7, Jesus said, It is very important, it is expedient that I go away. If I don't go, the comforter will not come. If I go, he will come. If I don't go, he won't come. If I go, he will come. We call that conditional clause statement. If I don't go, he won't come. That means that particular comforter was not there. He will come only if I go. And if you say the Holy Spirit, you go to the book of John chapter 20, verse 22. Jesus said to the disciple, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I, by the power of God, cast out devil. If you believe in me, it is not me that you believe. It is the Spirit in me. So that Spirit was not this particular comforter. All prophets are comforters. They were comforters. Between God and man, they comfort human beings. And they repair their soul and lead them to righteousness. They were comforters. But the question is, when we said this is Muhammad, they said, the Bible they say it's a comforter. Muhammad is not a comforter. 
So in return, I asked them again, fine. But did Jesus say comforter with his own mouth? Comforter? At the time of Jesus, there was no English language. He didn't say comforter. What did he say? This is translation. No, look, tell me what did he say in Hebrew language? He didn't speak English. He didn't say comforter. But Muhammad said, Ahmad. Ahmad. I'm going to wait. Listen, see if Muhammad is the Ahmad or the comforter. We discount what Jesus said in the Bible because Jesus did not speak English. He didn't say comforter. He said something. That answer can be found in the book of, uh, the book of, uh, which book? I'm asking. The book of uh, 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 Haggai, chapter 2, verse 5. God Almighty spoke to prophet Haggai. He said, oh, Haggai, I will shake all the nation, and the desire of all the nations shall come. And his temple will be greater than the one in Jerusalem. And I will call his temple peace. It's in the book. I didn't, it's, check it out. You could check it out and tell me. He said, the desire of all the nations shall come. And his temple will be greater than the one in Jerusalem. And in his temple, I will call it peace. The Quran said, Man kana. Whosoever come to the, uh, the Kaaban sanctuary, he is in peace and security. Allahu Akbar. Allah. This is the truth. Again, John 16, verse 12. Jesus said, when he was leaving, the time that he knew he was going, he said, Beloved, I have many things to tell you, but you can't understand it now. Why did he say that? You know, I have so many things to tell my children. I have so many things. They are too young. They can't grasp it. So I said, look, I want to show you something, but you can't. So on spiritual level, they were not higher enough. He said, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he didn't come yet. He will guide you into all truth, all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. Whatever shall he speak, so shall he be told. And he will declare unto you all things that are to come. And he will glorify me. Who is that? There is no time. I can explain this. This Holy Spirit matter, it takes me one hour, 20 minutes to decipher in details. But there is no time. Very unfortunate. My time is up. I'm going to respect the chair. I have so much to give, but I'm going to sit down. Uh, uh, any, any question you want to ask me, please, I'm exposed. You have to throw any question, inshallah. And by the grace of Allah, we would answer your question. Wa In the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave, that whosoever believe, when he say gave, he gave to a peace for the sins of mankind. Time may not permit me to begin to be opening scripture, to begin to portray many areas. You may not categorize say Jesus we are assigned to come and die in one scripture. But as you begin to see that the blood, they will begin to tell you, you begin to see in the Holy Scripture that the Jesus died for the sins of man. The blood of Jesus atoned for the sins of man. If you read the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 2, whatever, you will see something of source in that place. The book of Hebrews. But you may not categorize say that Jesus was assigned to come and die. But when you read the book of Hebrew, chapter 7, verse 2, even the book of Hebrew, chapter 8, that you will also discover Jesus Christ in the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for the sins of man. Thank you. The next question goes to Sheikh Awad. Do the Muslim brothers believe? That Jesus Christ is coming back again, and if he is really coming back again, what is he coming to do? Is he not really coming to be a sacrificial lamb? Yes, uh, the Muslims actually believe that Jesus Christ is coming back. The Quran did not mention that. The Quran didn't clearly say he's coming back. But most of the authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallam, it gave us our understanding that Jesus Christ will come back before the end of time. He's coming by because he did not die. Because the Bible said it is ordained for mankind, all man to die. And the next is resurrection. Christ is coming. The Christian believe that and the Muslim, we also believe that. But I am not waiting for Jesus. Personally, I'm not speaking for you. Why? Look, he's not coming to tell me, look, the, the month of Ramadan, you can fast that. Do it in Shawwal or Jumara Awal. Can he do that? 
he cannot say the five prayers make it four or six. Can you say that? No. The 2.5% we give in terms of zakah, he's not going to say, you know what, make it eight. He can. So he's coming to join me. So I am going. If he comes, alhamdulillah. If he doesn't come, alhamdulillah. But if he comes, the answer is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21, where Jesus said, not, listen to what he said, not all those about the day of his, when he come back, not all those who call me Lord, Lord, will enter heaven. But those who did the will of God, they will enter heaven. What is Islam? Islam is total submission to the will of God. So he said, not all those who call me Lord, Lord, will enter heaven. No. But those who do the will of God, they will enter heaven. Then he continued by saying, on that day, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, did you not prophesy in your name? In your name we cast out devil. In your name we do so many mighty miracles. And Jesus said, then I will tell them, get away from me. I don't know you. You evildoers. Do the Jewish call Jesus Lord, Lord? No. The Hindu, they call him Lord, Lord? No. The Buddhist, they call him Lord, Lord? No. Who call him Lord, Lord? Say, okay, and then I will tell them, get away from me, ye workers of iniquity. Iniquity is a Hebrew language. In which book of the scriptures in the Bible you are instructed to call upon the blood of Jesus at that moments of trouble? In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 11. I will read it right here so that you understand. It said, They overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And on his I a written, King of Kings and the Lord of Laws. In that area, we, we overcome challenges of life, the Satan, who is the enemy that brought challenges, by the blood of the, Jesus Christ. When you plead the blood of Jesus, Satan bow. So that is where we get the faith. That is where we derive, Christians derive the authority of the blood of Jesus Christ to confront whatsoever issue of challenge that comes their way. Because the blood of Jesus, it defeats Satan. The book of Revelation 12, verse 11. Thank you. Thank you. The next question goes to the Sheikh. If Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, then how comes it is recorded in the Bible, John 3, 16, John 14, 13, and 14, concerning his sonship? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the Bible said. Now listen to this. Begotten? Check your dictionary and tell me what is begotten. Begotten, it says, begotten belongs to the lowest animal function of sex. Are you prepared to attribute this to God Almighty that he beget a son? That's why the Muslims are, are crying so much. And Allah answered the question. Allah was angry and they say the merciful God has begot a son. I've quoted this already in the book of uh, Maryam. But the Bible said, God is begotten. The Muslims say, subhanAllah. God is not a father. Who did he begotten with? Listen, the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. It reads, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and Pharaoh. How did Abraham begot Isaac? With who? With his wife, Sarah. So why, why are you prepared to say God have begotten son? God has so many sons in the Bible. The word son of God in the Bible, it doesn't mean you are the son of God preeminently. In the book of Exodus chapter 4 verse 22, God said, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Ephraim chapter 19 verse 21, it said, Ephraim is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of uh, 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 Luke chapter 3 verse 38 Adam is my son in the book of John 1 John chapter 1 verse 12 it says for all you men and women who have the spirit you are given the power to become the sons and daughters of God so son of God doesn't actually mean son of God Jesus is son of God because that means he's a righteous person he's a godly person son of God it doesn't mean preeminent son of God thank you the last question 
first goes to the pastor, it says, if Jesus Christ truly died for our sins, then, and you said in your first statement that he was really the purest of lambs for sacrifice. How then did it occur in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, that what I say unto you, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of it in the day of judgment. For by their words thou shalt be justified, and by their words thou shalt be condemned. Can you explain that? As it stands to my position that Jesus is pure and holy, why I was here on earth. That word that you said that by your word I will justify you or condemn you. And actually the Bible also says that every word that comes out of our mouth we shall surely give account of it on the last day. By the word, a city can be set ablaze. By the word, a man can be saved. So whatsoever you use your mouth to say, either to believe, the Bible says, confession is from the mouth. But the heart is where you believe. But you must confess with your mouth what you believe. So if you believe, in Christ, you confess with your mouth and you are saved. Whatsoever you use your mouth to say, truly, it go a long way to condemn you or to save you, even on the day of judgment. I don't know if I am answered it clear. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, this is supposed to be the last question for the shade. But uh, there is a very um, imminent plea from the high table that will raise one last fundamental question to the sheikh. But this is not that much a question, so I'd like to ask it and then take the one from the high table, finally. Sheikh, uh, I don't know who this question is from, that if I want to actually accept Islam from what you have said, can you in brief tell me how I can prepare myself and take my journey through the faith of Islam. And to conclude with the question of the Sheikh, so when you are done with this, you go into that. What is the position of Islam on the pregnancy of Mary? And do Muslims believe in the conception of Mary and who is responsible? Alright, the first question I was asking, if someone wants to revert to become a Muslim, how does the person, you know, prepare herself or prepare himself? Uh, really, there is something in Islam called Hidayah. Hidayah is guidance. It comes from Allah. Allah said in the Quran, Allah uh, if Allah want to give you $10 million, you know, like, who wants to be a millionaire? If Allah wants to make you a billionaire, he expands your heart and he infuses Islam in it. Ours is to propagate and give you the clear fact, truth. It is for Allah to guide you. You have to ask yourself the purpose of life. Are you here? Why are you here? Why did God brought you here? Who are you worshipping? How do you worship? You want to worship? You have to worship the way prophets worship. The way the prophets worship, because Jesus worshiped the way the prophets worship. All religion, they pray and praise, but they don't worship. Islam pray and praise and worship. Only Islam would you find worship. Why did I say that? Ask Abraham in the book of Genesis 17 verse 3, and Abraham went and fell on his face, and the Lord spoke to him. In the book of Exodus 41 verse 30, and Moses and Aaron, and the son of Aaron, Eliza, put water at the entrance of the congregation, and they washed their hands and their feet before entering in the temple, and they bowed down with their head to the ground, and they did worship the Lord. In the book of Joshua, 
chapter 5, verse 14. And Joshua, the man of the Lord, removed the shoe from his feet and went further and fell on his face and worshipped the Lord. The same is true in First Chronicles and in the book of uh, uh, Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 4. And Ezra opened the book, and behind Ezra stood Maleka, Mashonaba, Joheshamen. And on the behind, behind of him stood many prophets. And Ezra read the book and praised the Lord. And all those behind him stood up and they say, Amen, lifting up their hand and they fell down and bowed down and worshiped the Lord. This is how you worship the Lord. So my sister, may Allah give you Hidayah. Whoever asked that question, may Allah give him guidance. Think about what I've just said and think about what they have said. And look at the Bible, look at the Quran. The Quran is the only book that have contained its own purity. Research on the Quran and inshallah, Allah will expand your heart and infuse Islam for you, inshallah. Yeah. What is the position of Islam on the pregnancy of Mary? And do Muslims believe in the conception of Mary? And if so, who's responsible? The Immaculate Conception of Mary has been enumerated in the Quran. In Surah Al-Maryam, Allah had given us to understand that she was secluded when the angel came unto her. And he told her, Allah have asked me to enunciate for you of a righteous son. Of a righteous son. And so she asked the angel, how can I have a man when no man have touched me? The Bible said, how can I have a man when I knew not a man? The same language. And the angel said, you know, even so, Allah created whatever he will. So the conception of Mary is an immaculate conception. The Muslim believe that as a miracle. Why did Allah do that? Allah performed so many miracles. If you look at Adam, no mother, no father, Allah's creation. Eve, she came from Adam, different form of creation. Adam have no mother, no father. Eve have father, no mother. Jesus, no father, but mother. You and I, mother and father. So Allah, Yahalu Kumar Yasha, He creates whatever He will. So in Islam, we believe 2,000% that Mary was given that you know, latitude to have the bed of a righteous servant who we call Jesus, whom we revere Him, we love Him, a messenger of God, a sign of God, a word of God, not a God. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Okay, if you want to have contact with the Sheikh, you can dial him on. Zero eight zero three three zero one zero eight zero three three zero one five one four two four two zero eight zero three three zero one five one four two. If you want to have contact with the pastor, you dial him on 080 76 9 I repeat, 080 Ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, we have come to the end of this program. And we're looking forward to seeing you in our next symposiums. I wish you a wonderful day.